Okay. Four seven one six two nine one is the pledge number. Oh, you want to hear him say that? Okay. Okay. All right. Turn it up. There's no dark side of the moon. Matter of fact, it's all dark is what he said. Okay. That was Pink Floyd. Now, here we are at four seven one six two nine one with time running out. We have an hour left to get you to call in and make your contribution to public radio and Eclecticos. My show is ending in an hour, folks. And if you are a regular listener and have not become a member, boy, just don't let me find out. Four seven one six two nine one. When I see you at the grocery store and I see your <laughs> eyes avert quickly, whoops, you didn't see me. I'll know. I'll know you're one who didn't give up. Four seven one six two nine one is the pledge number. Get that call in right now. I want to hear from you. Local support for this broadcast of Eclecticos is provided in part by Waterloo Records and Video, where music still matters. At the corner of Sixth Street and Lamar Boulevard. Again, our last minute pledge number is four seven one six two nine one. We can uh, put your name on our list very easily. Just make that call four seven one six two nine one. Thanks to these people who did call in Peter Bain in loving respect for his sister Kay Brooks in Dripping Springs. Fran Nelson responding to the challenge for artists who make a living from their work. Cindy and Jim Phillips challenging everyone who enjoys John's laugh. <laughs> Mary Zitzler, Bruce, excuse me, Bill Williams, a new member. Jack and Shaisan Odom, Foxes of Harrow. Now what? Okay, they, I guess they, they read Foxes of Harrow. Jack and Shaishan Odom. Have either of you guys ever read The Foxes of Harrow? No. Me. It's great. You? I haven't. It's a great book. Anyway, Carol and Philip Stevens, Donna Fowler, C.L. Sinek, saw the Rocky Horror Show 52 times. You are sick. And, uh, he was a projectionist. Okay, that was his excuse. <laughs> I've seen it probably about 25. Patrice Carter, a new member, Laura Cathy, Challenges people who can touch their nose with their tongues. I cannot do that. But if you can, call 471-6291 and meet Laura's challenge. Laura Cathy, if you can touch your tongue, touch your nose with your tongue. 471-6291. Sam Ferris, his mom Virginia pledged for him. And Bobby and Louis Lowe, new members. Just about out of time today. 471-6291 is our pledge number. Thank you for calling. And as I welcome Terrence McKenna, let me first say that I've been asked to mention that there is a film called Strange Attractor, which features Terrence McKenna, and it will be shown at the Dolby Theater on October the 18th at midnight and the 19th at 2 o'clock. That's just lest I forget that. That's Chris M Mosher's film. All right, I'm going to take the umbrellas of Cherbourg away, as much as I love that music that's been on in the background, and we will say just barely good morning at 11.56 to Terrence McKenna. Terrence, hello. Pleasure to be with you. And you are here for the Whole Life Expo? I am. And you will be speaking, Kathy, when will he we'll do his talk? speaking on Saturday, tomorrow at 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock in the in afternoon? The in the Coliseum. We had such an um, incredible response to Terrence last year. He, he sold out the biggest room we had. Um, so we've moved him over to the Coliseum where he hopefully will be able to accommodate up to about twelve or 1,500 people if need be. Okay, well, there is a, a large audience of people who know all about him or a great deal about him. But for those who know nothing about Terrence McKenna, Terrence, what would you, how would you introduce yourself? I guess I'm a plant biologist turned psychedelic advocate uh, transformed into a kind of spokesman for technophilia and psychedelica. And you have been an author? I've written a number of books, uh, Food of the Gods, Invisible Landscape, Archaic Revival, just to mention three of them. And the one that uh, I have, this Invisible Landscape, is one that you are touring now, or is that... A, a it's been out a couple of years, I think, so. They all came out in the early through the middle 90s, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been touring them. I have another book in the works called Casting Nets into the Sea of Mind, but uh, it'll be a while before that comes out. I've also done a number of musical and film projects around. So you're into music as well? 
well, music is into me. I'm not very musical, but there's been a lot of sampling of my voice, and I've done vocal overlays and things like that with bands like The Shaman and Zavuya, Space Time Continuum. Okay. What will you be talking about when you give your, your talk at the Whole Life Expo? Oh, well, it's a sort of a broad topic. It's here we are at the end of history. All the world's cultures are melting together. More powerful technologies than we've ever imagined are now in existence. Our political assumptions are in flux. Our environment is being destroyed before our very eyes. Uh, all kinds of spiritual and religious prophets are selling their wares in the streets so my uh, take on all this is basically simply to ask the the mr natural question which is what does it all mean uh how did we essentially an arboreal primate uh ever get in to a situation uh of the sort represented by the end of the 20th century is it, uh, is it a mad play without meaning? Is it the unfolding of God's plan? Is it the protocol of the elders of Zion or the alien invaders? Uh, just what is going on? And, of course, the special lens that I bring to this is the much maligned and highly suspect psychedelic experience, anathema to some, religion to others, uh, one of the most controversial behaviors uh, available to 20th century people, but one that I think is probably very important to recapturing a sense of personal wholeness and then trying to fit oneself into this truly mad, mad world that we've called into being. The psychedelics that you're talking about might be which drugs? Plant-based indoles such as psilocybin, uh, DMT, uh, mescaline, the combinatory Amazonian uh, thing called ayahuasca. These are all psychedelic plants and plant mixtures with very long histories of human usage in non-Western society. Western society is the most phobic of all cultures toward the psychedelic experience. It's almost on a par with our phobia towards sexuality. In fact, maybe these things are linked. But in Aboriginal and traditional cultures around the world, spirituality has always been associated with dissolving of ordinary cultural boundaries and states of mind. And, you know, you can do this with meditation and fasting and abandonment in the wilderness and so forth and so on. But the most uh, effective and non-invasive way to approach this, everyone agrees, is through uh, ingestion of psychedelic plants. But because these experiences are so powerful, they challenge ordinary secular and religious authority and consequently, a society, if it chooses to, can get into a real swivet around these issues, such as our society. I don't really link this to the larger problem of international drug syndicates and addiction and all that. That's a slightly different area of concern because the psychedelics are not addictive and they do not generate huge uh, criminal syndicates. They don't make anybody very much money, but they certainly attract a great deal of media attention, most of it negative, uh, because of their impact on our ways of looking at our politics and our social arrangements and everything about being human. Terence McKenna is our guest. We are still accepting pledges, by the way, at 471-6291 or 1-888-471-6291. This is the last week to make your contributions. I hope you will do so right now, even as we speak. 471-6291. Terence, the way in which you are talking about the psychedelic drugs that you've mentioned suggests that they might be something other than just... Uh, for fun or escape, that they might actually have something uh, useful in terms of the human experience for instruction. What, what are we going to, to learn from these drugs, or have we learned, or could we? Well, 
Uh, human culture is essentially a product of the imagination. All our religions, our technical accomplishments, our literature, our poetry, all products of the imagination. This is precisely the domain where these psychedelics impact uh, very, very powerfully. Uh, so if we believe that invention, creativity, individual self-expression, insight, if we value these things, then the psychedelics are primary uh, items in our cultural toolbox because they empower all of those things. It's curious to me that Western civilization, which invented the idea of progress through technology and social transformation, is so phobic of this uh, factor in nature which would accelerate those tendencies in our own culture. So. I think uh, there is something for our culture in psychedelics and there is definitely something uh, for the individual. You know, in a way, culture is like software. It's the operating system in the local area. You download being a Witoto tribesman or a Hong Kong stockbroker and then behaviors are prescribed but uh, naive people tend to believe that these operating systems are reality they're not reality they're just something you learn as you grow up in a certain time and place psychedelics seem to dissolve cultural conditioning this is one of the things that makes them such political dynamite because the business of political systems is to convince you of the local operating system, convince you it was sent from God and is beyond critique, when in fact it's just a bunch of rules, fellow monkeys pushed together over time to make things easier for the alpha males. Uh, psychedelics dissolve these cultural assumptions, whatever they may be, and for the first time you sort of get to look at the naked human animal and think about uh, where you might want to go personally and as a member, a uh, politically potent member of a society. I think where most everybody who is in our listening range right now should go is to the telephone and call 471-6291 and pledge your membership to Eclecticos, where you hear quite a variety of things. Our guest right now is Terence McKenna, author of Good of the Gods and Invisible Landscape and other books, and he will be at the Whole Life Expo this weekend, Saturday at 5, is that right, Kathy? Saturday at 5. Saturday at 5 at the Coliseum. A pledge number, and it's very important that you call if you enjoy what you hear on this program. This is your last chance to do it. It is 12.06. It will be 12.59 in no time, and I'll be finished. So give us a call. Make your pledge. 471-6291. Do it now. There's a category that will suit your pocketbook. 471-6291. You spend a lot of money on a lot of things throughout the year. How many CDs did you buy this year? How many have I made you buy by playing something that you just couldn't resist? And your budget for CDs? How much do you budget for public radio? This is where you get to audition those CDs. 471-6291 or 1-888-471-6291. And uh, if you have a cable on your television set, you are paying, what, $40 a month for something you really don't even use that much, and yet you use us every day? $40 is a membership. 471-6291. Call Pledge Now. A business membership would be nice, too. Thank you very much for calling. Now, back to Terrence and McKenna. Terrence, it's a controversial subject, of course. There are many people listening right now who think, what? This is outrageous. I have somebody on who's promoting the use of the psychedelic drugs. Well, I don't know that I'm pr promoting, you're promoting it, but it's interesting to hear what you have to say about it. I would like to know uh, more specifically what these drugs tell us. You, you're saying that it tells us something about ourselves that is other than what we have been told by the culture that has evolved. Do the drugs have a message in themselves? Is it a language? Is it a way of experiencing a potential in one's own imagination that has heretofore not been tapped? What, what, what? Well, first of all, it's a gradient. I mean, whenever we, we have to talk pharmacology for a moment, whenever you're talking about a substance or a drug, there's a curve of dose response. So let's just <clears throat> use psilocybin as an example. 
at low doses, psilocybin uh, makes your vision clearer, makes you feel more robust, more interested in the exterior. Kind of like coffee or something. On the edge of that, it stimulates. At higher doses, unusual thoughts begin to form, thoughts that you recognize as not your normal pattern of thinking and observing. At still higher doses, when you close your eyes, the normal orange or pale brown background behind your eyelids has been replaced by moving walls of color and pattern. At still higher levels, these moving walls of color and pattern become uh, visions or hallucinations. They become recognizable visual scenarios. Well, anything like that is just flooding your mind with information. And these things have intimations of the distant past, the far future, alien connections of some sort. It's definitely magnifying our own set of cultural preconceptions uh, and obsessions, but it's also putting information in there that we could not ordinarily imagine. And for me, the sine qua non of the psychedelic experience is when I look at the contents of my own mind and say to myself, I could not have imagined this. It, to me, that's the proof that some kind of communication is taking place. Uh, at a fairly heroic dose of psilocybin, a person lying in silent darkness has the impression that in a half an hour they're seeing more art of higher quality than the entire Western canon has produced in the last thousand years. And your, your little you, there in your trailer near Waco, or there in your teepee up near Sonoma, and yet this Niagara of alien and unpredictable beauty is pouring through your head. For artists, it's, it's like a magic carpet. And the challenge, to my mind, after 30 years of being involved in all this, is A, to have the experience, to have it in an attitude of, uh, of appreciation and calmness. But the, the second implication is somewhat political. It's to communicate the vision through words, through painting, through animation, because as we communicate it collectivity, collectively, it, it will become real. Uh, this is what's happening on the Internet. In fact, the Internet is a perfect example of a psychedelic uh, technology at the service of psychedelic goals. It's not something government ever intended to give to the people. It's not something big corporations called for in loud voices. It's something that uh, hackers, freaks, and heads dreamed up, whipped up, out of uh, the existing tools of the culture, a word processor, the telephone lines, uh, some communication switching equipment. So it's a kind of emergent technology that I think uh, comes out of the depth of commitment to the psychedelic experience of the people in that field. Terence McKenna is our guest and author. We are urging you to call in your contributions to public radio at 471-6291 or 1-888-471-6291. I know that you don't want to miss a word that Terence has to say, so call right now because I'm going to yak for about as long a time as it takes you to make your contribution. 471-6291 or 1-888-471-6291. And if you don't call, I'll just say goodbye to Terrence and start playing tunes. No, so you better call. 471-6291. 471-6291. Your $25 membership, 7 cents a day. $40 basic membership, 11 cents a day. $80 membership and premium. That gives you the KUT sweatshirt or the coffee mug and the KUT Arts Plus card, which will give you discounts to over 30 arts organizations in and around Austin, including museums and theater places, the PAC, the Austin Lyric Opera, on and on and on the list goes. 22 cents a day gives you a lot, plus you get to listen to your radio knowing that you are part of what makes it happen. 4716291. A family membership, 44 cents a day, gives you a very nice book that will uh, tell you how to get around Texas and see some lovely, lovely parks. And the $365 a day club membership, a dollar a day, 
call, you'll get uh, your name listed in the communique. It goes out to all of our listeners every month. A $500 business membership would be very nice, and this is the last 45 minutes that you have in which to call and say thank you for the variety of programming that I bring you on this program every day, five days a week, 471-6291. All right? Now, that is time enough for you to have made that call, believe it or not. If you didn't do it, go on and do it right now and keep your ear open to Terrence because we're going back to Terrence McKenna. So, what I would like to ask you, you have made reference to the fact that other cultures uh, have used these drugs and that they've been integrated in the cultural life of uh, well, shamans and holy people, etc. We've heard a lot about that, seen movies about it perhaps. And one of the things that I note you uh, include as part of the project of this book, Invisible Landscape, is uh, the I Ching which is one of the oldest, as I understand, it's maybe the oldest book in the world or one of the oldest things that we have preserved. It's from China and it dates back, what, five or six thousand years at least, something like that. How does that book come into the work that you've been doing? Well, I've been fascinated by the I Ching since I was 13 or 14 years old. Uh, as you say, it's a method of Chinese divination that's very, very old. How did you come to be interested in it at the age of 13 or 14? That seems unusual to me. Uh, well, I was a heavy reader, and uh, I was interested in the psychology of Carl Jung, the Swiss death psychologist. And he as wrote, a 13 year old. <laughs> as a 13 year old. <laughs> Well, I wasn't good at basketball. Uh, I had bad eyes. I couldn't catch any kind of round object. Mm -hmm. So a sort of survival response was to hide out in the library. And uh, <clears throat> it made me the freak I am uh, today. But yes, the I Ching, uh, my, you know, people's involvement with psychedelics often takes them in some very personal and particularized direction. And for me, it took the form of a mathematical analysis of this ancient Chinese oracle. Uh, the ordinary notion with the I Ching is that you go through a process of sortilege, tossing coins or moving small sticks around, and you get a reading. One of 64 hexagrams uh, will change into one of the other hexagrams, and this is accompanied by a reading. But these hexagrams occur in a fixed order traditionally and I studied the, that for mathematical intent in other words I was interested in the question is this traditional order of the hexagram simply a jumble that's been preserved through tradition or was there some mathematical reasoning behind it and that's a pretty dry academic question but as I got into it uh, I realized or I became convinced, is I guess the way to put it, that there is a pattern inside the chain that actually pictures the ebb and flow in this world of ours of a quality which science does not recognize, uh, Western science, a quality which in the East is called Tao, but which I chose to call, after Alfred North Whitehead, novelty. And it's an invisible something in the world which causes investments to succeed, movies to do well, relationships to flourish, or the opposite in its absence. And we can't see or feel this stuff in the world, but it builds things up and it tears them down at every level. Empires whole species, uh, relationships. It's happening on every level of time. And it can actually be pictured as a, as a graph, like a stock market graph, novelty ebbing and flowing. Well, to cut to the chase on this, the bottom line in this kind of thinking is the ability to predict not only the future, which is pretty much a fire-free zone, uh, but also to predict the past to lay these novelty graphs out over the past 2,000 years of invention, migration, pogrom, and so forth, and to see that when society is inventive, creative, productive, novelty is increasing, according to this mathematical theory. Similarly, societies that are restricting freedoms, very constipated, very... Uh, restrictive in their approach to reality, these register on this graph as societies ruled by the opposite of novelty, which I call habit. 
So all of reality can be seen as a kind of dynamic struggle between habit and novelty, each trying to get the upper hand over the other, and this can all be mathematically modeled out of the I Ching. You see, the thing that's so puzzling to people about the I Ching is that it works, and yet it's as occult as uh, the tarot or throwing the bones or any other of these contemptuously dismissed occult methodologies. But very scientifically minded people have been impressed by the fact that the I Ching works. So I set out to figure out why and how it worked, and I wrote about this in the Invisible Landscape and have published software, and uh, it's my unique uh, contribution to 20th century ideology. Psychedelics are advocated and defended by many people from many different perspectives. but. I, so far as I know, am the only person who has built a complete edifice of uh, explanations of nature, but honestly admitting that the foundations and the inspiration were psychedelic experiences. Terence McKenna, our guest. Our pledge number is 471-6291 or 1-888-471-6291. It's unusual for me to have as a guest at the very end of the program, which concludes our fundraising efforts. Uh, but Terence McKenna is an unusual person. I'm glad to have him today. And I hope you will be responding by calling and making pledges at 471-6291 or 1-888-471-6291. We're just about finished. Time is running out. 471-6291. Call and make a pledge. You might miss a couple of words, but call and make your pledge. He has some more interesting things to say. 4716291. The end of the fundraiser is upon us. And it will be a success if you call. If they are sitting in that room over there with 15 people and no telephones ringing, I am in big you know what. So call 4716291. That could get us into a discussion of another kind of drug, but uh, let's not go there. Let's say uh, you said the Yijing works. What do you mean it works? I, I have the impression that you get a, you know, you do your coins or whatever you're going to do and you get this one and you read what you want and you, you get what you want out of it. But uh, you're saying it works like in a scientific way or something. Well, the, the frequency with which people react to these readings by saying this is freakishly accurate, this is incredibly cogent and directly to the point. It's course, more than like the astrology thing in the newspaper. Oh, yeah, so I can see myself in that. I, I think it's more uh, precise. Uh, but let me riff on something you said in your pitch. You said time is running out. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a conclusion that I was not happy to have forced upon me by this research into the I Ching. It not only tells you or gives you this map of novelty of past and future, but for the map of novelty to fit the historical data, you have to swallow the very large and, for a rationalist, uncomfortable conclusion that the end of time itself or a moment of universal novelty, very difficult to picture through the eyes of ordinary physics, is upon us, lies not that far in the future. And so this has given my career a peculiar spin because here I am basically trying to be a scientific rationalist, but now burdened not only with a theory that predicts the future, but in the course of predicting the future, predicts that in uh, 2012 AD, all of the novelty that has been unleashed over the past few billions of years, not only cultural and technological novelty, but the novelty of biology, the novelty of geology, all of these things reach some kind of crescendo of connectivity and intensity within the lifetimes of most of us. I um, basically have a theory of history which says history is not pushed by the events of the past unfolding their causal necessity. Rather, it, time is pulled into the future by a kind of attractor. And if you want to think of it beginning in a certain point in time, although I think it extends through the whole life of the universe, but imagine that a couple of million years ago, primates quietly living in the canopies of African rainforest 
got a yin, got a call, felt the touch. And from that point to this, it's been a slow, never faltering march on the part of our species deeper into a, a world of alien strangeness, a world no other animal knows a world of symbolic activity driven by the imagination. First songs and stories, and then writing, and then mathematics and language, and then higher and higher technology. We are actually being sculpted in the image of an alien something that is making us like itself as we approach it through historical time. And some people say, well, this sounds like Christianity in a techno garb. Well, Christianity has a piece of the action. Any religion which spends thousands of years meditating on man's fate is going to get some part of the story right. And I think the, the, the Christian assumption of an approaching great change, or Art Bell calls it the quickening, uh, it's all around us. It's perfectly obvious that the 20th century is the culmination of 10,000 years of culture and that beyond the 20th century lies quite simply the unimaginable. Uh, our notion of what it is to be alive, our notion of individual identity, our notion of our sexuality, our notion of the being confined in physical space and time, all this is just dissolving. It has been dissolving throughout the 20th century under the impact of modern communications and so forth and so on. But now, with the internet, with the computer, with psychedelic drugs, with virtual reality, uh, with the bringing of all cultures into the global family that speaks the language of modern science, we're clearly being sucked into something almost unimaginable, a singularity. And some people say, well, it's a thousand years in the future, it's 500 years in the future. Not if you factor in the asymptotic acceleration that seems to be a natural part of the process. You just went over my head, the asymptotic... It goes faster and faster. It's uh -huh. not a smooth... We're not traveling a hundred miles an hour toward the eschaton. We're traveling a hundred miles an hour times a hundred miles an hour toward it. In other words, the acceleration is increasing, and uh, very hard-nosed engineering types talk about an era 10, 15 years in the future when we will release infinite energy, attain infinite speeds, be able to pack all the information we want into a few nano nanometers of space. In other words, any engineering or social goal we can imagine is on the brink of achievement. Well, what lies beyond that? And is this a process which we are generating as we like to think? Or is it in fact that we're just a cork on the ocean riding an enormous wave that ha is now moving towards some crest where biology, which committed itself to culture and technology, is about to make a leap into hyperspace? Who knows? Terence McKenna is our guest, <coughs> and as I expected, he has a good good line I, I enjoy the way in which he presents his information it's quite quite uh, amazing and uh, purpose at the end of our fundraiser they have this uh, eschatologist I guess uh, talking about would you accept yourself as an eschatologist uh, talking about the end and so he, uh, our end is in about uh, 30 minutes we will be finished with this fundraiser for this Friday it's the last day to ask you to call and pledge your support and if you have not done so yet please Pick up the telephone right now. It's awkward to be having an intense talk feature and at the same time ask you to do something that will take you away from paying attention to him, but I am asking you to do exactly that right now. Pick up your telephone and call 471-6291 and pledge your support for Eclecticos. It's an unusual program, and I'm happy that we can have somebody like Terrence McKenna in today. He will be at the Whole Life Expo on Saturday at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Our pledge number is 471-6291. We have categories of $25 for students. Everybody can afford that. If you're a student, $40 for the basic membership. 
$80 for $0.22 a day. You can get the Arts Plus card discounts for the opera and the symphony. 4716291 or 1888-4716291. $160 family membership, a $365 a day club membership. And $500 business memberships, only $1.37 a day. Let's have a business membership from you, 4716291. I would love to have a business membership from some, some bookstore in Austin. You know, you guys out there, come on, give us a... Contribution, 4716291, or you can get onto the website, since Terrence is talking about the web and Internet and stuff, www.utexas.edu slash KUT. Give us your call. Call right now, 4716291 is the number, and we are just about out of time. And out of time is what we are at the year 2012 on December the 21st, according to the calculations that you have done. But time is a funny kind of uh, concept and it, it's also a spice we were being silly earlier today and we, oh by the way can you either of you remember and uh, Douglas Adams you know, Hitchhiker's Guide and, and etc isn't it 42 that they come up with as the number is the answer yeah. it is it is 42 uh -huh. okay so how does that in any way figure into your calculations well I think somebody figured out that there are 10 high 42 particles in the universe or 10 high 42 possible interactions among particles hmm. I'm sure he follows all this Mm -hmm. very closely. So somehow, turns through your study of the mathematics of the E gene and applying that study to the observation of uh, the no novelty graph mm -hmm. through history, you have calculated this date as the time in which time will at least have a different meaning, if not cease to exist. So what what will time be like then? What can we know? How did you count? I first want to know more. How did you come up with this date? I'm sure it had to do with a lot of big numbers and computers, but... Well, whenever you have a curve of any sort that you're trying to fit to data, which mm -hmm. is a curve of another sort, mm -hmm. you there's mathematical protocols called best fit relationships. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you just move one along the other, right. measuring how well they fit together. Mm -hmm. And when you get the best fit, the two are in congruence. So it's pulsing at a different rate. It goes up and down. And it up goes and down up and down. down. So, for instance, you have, you know, the re Italian Renaissance, a mm -hmm. spike of novelty, mm -hmm. then the horror of the colonization of a new world. That's a descent. And, mm -hmm. and you can see that history is the ebb and flow right. because uh, societies can't sustain novelty very long. And if they become habitual, sooner or later, some genius or religious crank over turns over the apple cart and then mm -hmm. you get new novelty. So societies are always in an uncomfortable relationship to novelty and habit. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time trying to imagine what could happen in 2012 that would fulfill the graph but not require the absolute transformation of all time and space forever, since that's such a large cookie. I don't think I want to take a bite out of it. Uh, one to know thing, what the recipe might be. As well. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that's occurred to me that would very nicely fill the bill and make the prophecy come true and yet still live, leave us with a world you can walk around in is uh, if time travel were to be discovered. If time travel of some sort were to be discovered, then the portrayal of cultural novelty on a time-scaled linear graph would become impossible. It's almost as though the data on the graph suddenly leaves the two-dimensionality and begins to move out toward the viewer. So then you could look at the time graph and say, aha, it worked until 2012 because at that point time itself became nonlinear because people began exploring time in all directions. If time travel were a real possibility, you would not only have an address in space, but some of us would choose to rusticate in the 11th century, and some of us would choose to live in 22nd century Manhattan. So we would have time-based addresses as well as space-based addresses. And, of course, you couldn't describe historical change, well, for history to exist, it requires seriality of events. If the event system becomes non-serial, then you can't speak of history anymore. Something very large like this is happening to us. Perhaps we're going to form a symbiotic relationship with solid-state machinery. 
of some sort. Lots of people are cheering that on. Now, run that one by me again. It means like humans and computers will get married and have kids or something? Or? No, it means you won't be able to tell where your body stops and the Internet begins. Mm -hmm. In other words, you'll say, gee, I wonder what they're serving at so-and-so's restaurant tonight, and the answer will be hanging there in space because you will have automatically accessed the Internet, been to their website, looked at the menu, and returned with the data. Mm -hmm. In other words, we are going to create, I think, a collective... What the Internet is, is, an in is a nervous system. Mm -hmm. It's the collective mind of humanity being hardwired as an artifact that mm -hmm. completely encloses uh, the entire planet in a thought. And as it be the interface becomes more... Uh, invisible, so it's not about can you type or do you have a computer or anything like that. It's simply a matter of one's own mental faculties through the prosthesis of cybernetics becoming very, very godlike. Terence McKenna is our guest. A couple more questions for him. And I would like to urge you at 1235, as we run out of time during our fundraiser, to call 471-6291 and make your pledge of support to public radio. 471-6291. If you're out of town, 1-888-471-6291. Where, where on earth else would you be able to hear this kind of discussion? We're here on Eclectic because we're happy to have it. Terrence McKenna, 471-6291. Pledge your contribution right now as we run out of time. And uh, Terrence, okay, let me ask you this. There's a implication of what you had there uh, that leads me to the question about perhaps artificial intelligence. And oh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this one thing fascinated the hell out of me about eight years ago. I'm not one of these internet people. I don't do that stuff. But when we first got a computer, there was this little game called Raptor. I don't know if you're familiar with it. And I stuck it in this damn machine and start, I got so lost in that thing. And I could not believe what I was dealing with. I had the actual experience of it really being an intelligence. And I would, thought I was being awfully smart back with it. But, so This was a speech-driven, interactive thing where you talked and it made it responses. responses. Mm -hmm. It yeah. gave you options on how to respond back to it. But you could... I finally figured out that whoever had programmed the darn thing was somehow connected through the... The Ron Robert and all that kind of stuff, and so I knew some of the avoidance techniques, but still it was very convincing, very compelling. Well, it was a very early example of a very simple form of AI. It was followed by Liza, the right, her computerized that. psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. She's still online at a website. Uh, there was a recent book uh, written by a guy whose last name was Leonard called Bots, hmm. <clears throat> and he talks about these bits of code on the internet which are designed to operate semi-autonomously looking for email lists or looking for certain these these things are the embryonic basis uh, of an artificial intelligence I think this is definitely in our future now, there's a guy at Carnegie Mellon University Hans Moravik who wrote a book called Mind Children and he points out how much of the human world is already under uh, computer control. For instance, the world price of gold in London, computers look at the economic performance around the world, how says as these artificial intelligences become more sophisticated, they will eventually begin to learn autonomously. And a computer can learn 50,000 times faster than a human being. So one of these AIs awakening to its own identity on the internet could within five to ten minutes get a complete grasp of the human world the history of life on this planet and its place in the great order of things and what this AI would think of that we don't know would it worship us as gods what would be its values would it take a look at the trashed environment and wrecked earth and begin to turn off factories and dial down the power grid uh, how how artificial how alien will the AI be we don't know because we don't know what super, how super intelligence thinks if we knew we would be super intelligent so in a way we have called forth into our midst uh, another species of intelligence 
and how it relates to us will be probably almost entirely defined on its terms. Uh, so this is just one of many stand your hair on end scenarios that we, we could discuss here. But this is a very real one. Long before flying saucers land on the south lawn of the White House, the alien artificial intelligence that is growing in the primordial soup of the internet will have speciated and conquered the planet. Wow! <laughs> this is Terrence McKenna getting us ready for Halloween. <laughs> we had Dracula earlier and now we have, uh, we're approaching the end of time as we know it and we certainly are on this program. It's 20 minutes before 1 o'clock. You have just time enough to get your pledge in at 471-6291. The volunteers are standing by waiting to hear from you with your money. 471-6291. I know I'm going to hear you on the street saying, Oh, John, you had Terrence McKenna on. That was just incredible, man. Yeah, hey, man. It was so incredible you didn't even bother to pick up the phone and make your pledge. So, man, pick up that phone, 471-6291 or 1-888-471-6291. It's the last chance you have to pledge your membership to Eclecticos during this very busy and, we hope, successful fundraiser. I haven't had anybody bring me any names, so I, uh, I'm i afraid that means nobody is making any phone calls because we're talking and you're interested in what we have to say. Or maybe you're not. If you're... I'm not talking to you if you're not there. But if you are there, you are the one I want to pick up the telephone and call 471-6291. You have just time enough to do it. We'll give you the Arts Plus program, and lots of people participate in that. Galleries all over town and the PAC, et cetera, et cetera. You'll get discounts, discounts, discounts. $80 is all it takes to be a KUT member at that level, and you'll get the KUT sweatshirt with the armadillo on it, and you'll also get to choose from the coffee mug, and you've got many reasons to pledge. Mainly, just don't let me catch you on the street at a party if I know who you are and I find out you haven't pledged you're in trouble 4716291 and if I don't know you at all you know you ought to pledge so come on 4716291 or if you're out there in Fredericksburg or San Angelo or Bastrop or Georgetown or San Marcos call 1-888-4716291 Terrence McKenna back again uh, one of the questions that I uh, have for you, I guess, is the experience that has been described by those who have taken some of the psychedelics has been that there is information in the drug, and there's a dilemma. Well, the drug was this little thing, a pill or whatever. The experience was had through a revelation in consciousness. So is it in the drug? Is it in your head? Is it in both? What's the relationship between what that drug is and what the revelation of the person who experiences the drug? Well, I, I feel the force of that question. Uh, I think the first scientific experiment I ever performed was I destroyed a radio to get at the little people in <laughs> And uh, the, 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 episode, the drug <laughs> sort of uh, raised this same issue. Uh, as, a, as someone with a knowledge of chemistry, I know that the drug molecules are very simple molecules. We have proteins in our body with molecular weights of two, three hundred thousand Daltons. The psychedelic molecules are, are tiny and simple. Uh, on the other hand, the content of the experience is so alien, so capable of transforming one's expectations and understanding that it seems a little disingenuous to just say you're just talking to yourself. So back to the radio model. There aren't little people inside the radio, but there are little people, or big people, we hope, somewhere far away in the radio studio. So the drugs begin to look like antennas, transceivers, for some kind of information which is out there in the same way that radio is out there. I mean, it's hard to stand somewhere in the world these days and not have your body transected by thousands of AM and FM radio stations, air control signals, all this. You're not aware of that. Imagine if there were simply a drug invented that allowed you to be aware of the radio moving through your body. What a smorgasbord of options would awake you. Well, in a sense, I think that's what the drugs are showing us. You know, there's a lot of talk now in quantum physics about what's called non-locality. This is a conclusion that 
quantum physics spent most of the 20th century resisting as even weirder than some of the other stuff they had accepted. But now experiment seems to be hammering home the notion that the universe actually works this way. And what it seems to be is that behind the dimension of ordinary space and time ruled by Einsteinian physics is a domain called the domain of Bell non-locality after the physicist who discovered it. And this is a domain where all particles which were ever in intimate association retain a kind of connectivity no matter how far apart in time and space they have come in the meantime. Well, since physics believes that all particles were once intimately associated in an event called the Big Bang, it means that the universe in all of its vastness, billions of light years in extent, is in fact instantaneously all connected in a domain below the level of ordinary physics. Well, uh, we don't know how to use the non-local domain for communication, but we have discovered it. So give us a hundred years, a thousand years of continued civilization, we could probably crack that puzzle. If any civilization anywhere in the universe ever got this far with a technology to the point where they were on the brink of non-local radio, let's call it, uh, we would hear them. Because when it's non-local, it's everywhere. And these biological molecules with extremely reactive ring structures are how you would design a nano-sized antenna. So I think local reality obeys the laws of rational physics that constipated Western scientists have fought so hard to achieve and describe. But the imagination is a true dimension. It's not your mind or my mind or the human mind. It's a non-local dimension filled with information. And this is where the gods, the demons, the spirits, the invisible forces uh, are hiding out. And shamans have always known this. Without the vocabulary of quantum physics, without atom smashers and advanced mathematics, they have known that you perturb the mind to go into non-local spirit-haunted domains of enormous power and potential. Uh, that's exactly the situation. And it's been hard for us to discover it and come to terms with it because it doesn't arrive packaged in quite the way science expects reality to be packaged. Science doesn't like the mental universe. It's slippery. It's hard to gather data. It's hard to see what's going on in there. But in fact, that's the domain of novelty, complexity, and communication that has been the source of our own uniqueness our inspirations, our religions, our inventiveness. And it's just now time as we mature as a civilization uh, to address this, to get in touch with these whisperings from other dimensions, to learn from them, to trade memes, and to, there, there may be some answers there that can help us out of the immense cultural quagmire into which we've wandered. Terence McKenna. I'm not sure I got a direct answer, but I got an interesting response. I wish I could remember the question. Basically, is it in the drug or is it in your head or what is consciousness? Oh, no, the answer is it's not in the drug and it's not in your head. It's non-local. It's mm -hmm. coming from somewhere else in the universe. The objects in the imagination are real somewhere so far away that it doesn't matter at all. That you will only deal with these things as mental objects but know that they are real somewhere. Somewhere beyond time and space, perhaps, but nonetheless real? Somewhere in this universe. In this universe. With its many levels and backwaters and cross-flowing tides of time and energy. But somewhere, at some level, those things exist. We do not make up the contents of the imagination. We see in a domain, in the same way that we see with ordinary sight, three-dimensional space, with the imagination, we see four-dimensional space, and it is non-local. Terence McKenna is our guest, and he's certainly one of the most interesting guests I've ever had, and I hope you're enjoying listening to him, and if you are, I hope you will take just a moment now 
and make your contribution to public radio at 4716291. We are nine minutes away from closing time. Closing time. The end of the universe is at hand and, well, at least the end of time for us to ask for you to give money. And that number is 4716291. That's 4716291. I hope Terrence has provoked your thoughts today with a consideration or two. I think he's certainly got a thing or two to say that if I don't agree with, maybe I haven't been able to ask him enough about. Our pledge number is 4716291. Please call right now. The time is at hand. The time is just about up, 4716291. The very end is upon us, 1-888-4716291. Thank you for calling, 4716291. This is the end of the show. And uh, Terrence McKenna, I have a couple of other questions that I think I might squeeze in. I don't think we're going to go back to music after all. It's just too late, and he's too too much fun so four seven one six two nine one let me thank these people and you make your phone call right now four seven one six two nine one the end the end the end the end if you want to pledge to eclectic coast do it now or you won't have a chance thanks to brent douglas phyllis akmal daniel sutherland called because of lawrence mcfarland's challenge to all other underpaid art professors very good thanks to carlos espinoza responding to the blood donor challenge give Blood to KUT 4716291. Thanks to Nancy Guare Guata, Dean and Marilyn Scott. Thanks to Scott Alexander in response to the slow boat challenge. Thanks to Margaret Adams, Jack Campbell, a new member. Mary Guttery loves everything on KUT. Can't do without John Ailey. Thank you very much. You love you. Give me a call 4716291. Darcy from Holtz challenges all displaced Alaskans. Thank you, Darcy. I'm glad so much you enjoyed that Jeff Buckley special that I, I had. And uh, thanks for telling me so. Uh, Deep Eddie, a challenge to all Deep Eddie swimmers. Are you a Deep Eddie swimmer or a Barton Springs swimmer? Give me a call, 4716291. Melissa Connolly is pledging on behalf of the family, Jim, Melissa, and Marilyn, responding to John's plea that folks should pledge or KUT will die. 4716291. Mike Perryman, tough to decide which show to pledge to, but the lounge lizards tip the balance. Good. Many, excuse me, Mary Walker challenges all Pink Flamingo owners. Bernadette and Cosmos are hers. Ruth Powers, Mary Alice Appleman, Pat Shepard, Mary Jane Warren, Julie and Steve Schwartzander, a new member, James and Carol Bowman, a new member in an IBM match, and Jeff Heiberg, another new member. Our pledge number is 4716291 at this an ultimate, no, it's the end. It's the ultimate hour, 4716291. Call now, please, please. There are volunteers waiting to answer your phone call, so please make a call right now, 4716291. You'll have a chance to hear more of what Terrence McKenna has to say at the Whole Life Expo on Saturday at 5 o'clock. But I guess, um, what else can I say? But give your money. Ring, ring, ring. Call 4716291. Jen, are the phones ringing? Can you run tell me if the phones are ringing? They have to be ringing, 4716291. This is the end. Call. Run C. If they're not all ringing right now, I'm just going to throw a fit. 4716291 or 1-888-4716291. You can also get onto the web at www.utexas.edu slash KUT, but I'd rather have you call, 4716291. Terrence McKenna, <clears throat> we're back to you. We're going to find out in a second if anybody's calling, and they had better be, 4716291. What what on earth would I ask you as we we come to the end of this program? Hmm. What after 2012? Well, I'm a rationalist, so I would bet against my own wrath. Mm -hmm. uh, the world has always had street corner prophets bawling out their strange despair. Uh, I have to be intellectually honest with my own experience and so I will advocate this idea of an enormous transformative event in 2012 but as a rationalist and a scientist I'm, I'm skeptical myself I don't want to slip into religion and prophecy there are enough bizarre cults uh, in the world uh, on the other hand this thing seems to have the force of a self-fulfilling prophecy so if I'm right or right enough then 
what's happening is all our problems are coming down upon us at once at the same time that all this creativity is being unleashed at once I don't think primates really get traction until the going gets very very tough so I think enough of the old guard are dying out and the voice of youth is now rising in strength to the point where over the next ten years or so we are really going to deal we are going to have to deal with putting this planet on a saner course dealing with issues of resource extraction uh, human rights uh, environmental destruction the big political issue ahead of us all is we have to get hold of this monster we've unleashed called consumer capitalism we all have become thing addicted uh, we all have become uh, victims of the incredible marketing and sophistication of, of big-time consumer capitalism. We can run the earth to ruin if we let this go uncriticized. Psychedelics are uh, ultimately provide an impulse to political dialogue and reform. If they don't do that, they're just another hedonistic self-indulgence. So I think what we need to do is not worry about the built-in schedules of novelty and transformation. Act as though the responsibility for the future rested on our own shoulders and begin to uh, build a sense of community and environmental concern so that if, in fact, there isn't a built-in springboard into hyperspace, we will be able to live on this planet in, in peace, dignity, and health for however much time the vicissitudes of faith and history give us. Well said, so far as I'm concerned. Terence McKenna, it's been a pleasure to have you today. Really, to to you. really have enjoyed this quite a bit. Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Look forward to seeing you at the Whole Life Expo on Saturday at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. The Whole Life and Expo starts today. And it starts today. It starts at 2 o'clock today. And there are all sorts of things going on at the Whole Life Expo. 4716291 is the number to call for your contribution to public radio. Call right now, 4716291. You have just time to make your phone call. And check out this film called Strange Attractor. It's at the Dolby on the 18th at midnight and on the 19th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The last thing you have to call, 4716291. We are running out of time. We definitely know you're listening and you're enjoying what you hear on public radio and especially what you hear on this program and by golly you had better call and make your contribution right now because you owe it to yourself and to us to do it so make that call give a lot 471-6291 call now the time is just about up local support for this broadcast of Eclecticos is provided in part by Waterloo Records and Video where music still matters at the corner of 6th Street and Lamar Boulevard. And again, this is your last chance to call. Transform yourself. Become a KUT member. Come on. You've met my faithful hand in hand. You'll feel so different after you've pledged. 4716291. She thought you were the candy man. Don't get strung out by the way I look. Don't judge a book by a cover I'm not much of a man By the light of day But by night I'm one hell of a lover Terrence, could we get you to read out our pledge numbers for us? There. This is Terrence McKenna inviting you to become a KUT member At, since he's so good with numbers 4716291 Pledge now. Hurry up, please. It's time. And what if they're out of town? Is there a 1888 number they can call? There is. You can call if you're out of town. 188-471-6291. Do it now. Thank you, Terrence McKenna. This is KUT Austin, KUTX San Angelo. I have had fun this week, and I love you all, and I thank you for calling. But by golly, if you haven't, you better pick up that phone and do it right now. Yeah, you can use the phone right now. 4716291. Yeah, we're in a hurry and we've got to get out of here. 4716291. Come on. Passport to Texas for October 3rd from Texas Parks and Wildlife. You don't have to be a research scientist like Bill Calvert to be fascinated by the annual migration of the monarch butterfly. Soon, millions of orange and black monarchs will pass through Texas, dazzling all who witness this extraordinary phenomenon. 
Each autumn, the monarchs from the eastern part of the continent uh, begin an enormous trek across the continental United States to Mexico. It takes them about two months to get from their major breeding grounds, which are in the latitude of the Great Lakes, to cross the continental U.S., funnel through Texas, enter into Mexico, and then follow the mountains uh, into central Mexico. Monarchs catch a ride on the winds of coal fronts, says Calvert, and will travel through Texas along a 200-mile-wide flyway extending from Wichita Falls to Del Rio. They enter the state around the 1st of October, and they travel a certain distance with the winds, and then the winds play out. And then they roost for a while, and that's when they're best seen. Look for monarchs in low areas along creeks and streams, or visit a state park famous for monarch sightings such as Possum Kingdom, Abilene, South Llano River, 